Good morning. I want to uh, again express my uh, pleasure being invited back a second time to Lutheran uh, Study Days. It's a real uh, honor uh, to be here, uh, to work uh, again with my uh, good friend Jim Nestigan, and uh, to be uh, here with other uh, colleagues as, as well. Uh, and and uh, I really, uh, really appreciate uh, your hospitality and kindness in having me here. Uh, what I propose to do in the three lectures that I have is to look at um, really kind of three aspects of Luther's theology. Uh, we're going to start uh, this morning with vocation in light of the preached God. I'm not sure who came up with the titles, but I really appreciate the titles. Uh, Jarl, I assume you probably did that. And I'm going to try to stick with the titles as closely uh, as possible and uh, look at these uh, three topics, uh, vocation in light of the preached God. And then in the uh, second lecture uh, this morning, we will look at uh, justification, creation, and the question of what does faith have to do with created things. And then finally, uh, tomorrow we'll wrap up with first things first, uh, the first commandment. So we're kind of, uh, in some ways, going in reverse order in the catechism here. But that's OK, because all of the six chief parts really do uh, hang together. And I, um, I hope that you will see, again, some of the continuity and interconnections uh, between these topics as we um, as, as we as we move forward. We got everything adjusted there? Okay. Okay. Uh, also bear with us a little because uh, Jarl and I are going to try to coordinate changing slides here on the, uh, um, on, on the PowerPoint. But now to this uh, first topic, a vocation in light of the preached God. Uh, obviously there are two really kind of important aspects to the topic. Uh, one is the doctrine of vocation itself. Uh, vo doctrine of vocation has sometimes been referred to as the lost treasure of the Lutheran Church. Um, that uh, when people think of vocation, often they reduce vocation simply to occupation, to a job. What do I uh, do? Kind of Monday to Friday and miss the point that uh, is so evident in the New Testament and also in Luther's theology that vocation has first of all to do with who we are. That we have been called by uh, the gospel, uh, the calling that the Holy Spirit issues is a calling to faith, and then called to faith we live a life of love to the neighbor. It's also been said that uh, in Luther's uh, reformational discovery, of course, justification of the ungodly through faith in Christ is uh, key and central, uh, but corollary to that is Luther's rediscovery of vocation, a place of the Christian uh, in the world. We've said that uh, in the topic or in the title, Vocation in light of the preached God. That language, of course, comes from Luther's uh, work against Erasmus on the bondage of the will. God preached uh, as, as the word of the cross, the word of Jesus Christ is proclaimed so that in and through him alone do we know who God is and God's intention, God's disposition uh, for us. And so what I hope to do in this first hour is to draw these two themes together. Vocation, preached God. So let's uh, dig into it then. We can change slides there. Um, the overall theme of this conference, the triune God gives himself, uh, taken from Martin Luther's Confession Concerning Christ's Supper, 
1528. Uh, very significant Reformation writing. In fact, Luther said of this writing, I'm willing to tuck this book under my arm and stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, it, there, Luther demonstrates something about the nature of confession. That confession is not simply an airing of a theological opinion, or this is what I think to be the truth, uh, but confession is always done quorum Deo, before God, and over and against the eschatological horizon. Uh, you see that kind of language in the pastoral epistles in the New Testament, uh, where uh, Paul speaks of his own good confession in light of the last day. And this is exactly how Luther himself understood the act of confession saying back to God in the presence of the world what God has said to us in his son Jesus Christ as we are given this Christ in uh, the Holy Scriptures. And, and so uh, Luther's great confession concerning Christ's Supper, 1528, year before the small and large catechism. That's going to be significant. We'll talk about that a bit later. But in this uh, confession of Christ's body and blood in the sacrament, then Luther appends um, a more uh, kind of comprehensive confession of the Apostles' Creed, but also along with uh, the Creed, a confession of what we have come to know as the three estates, the three orders. More on that in a moment. But with uh, the great confession, Luther makes this Trinitarian confession. And it has really, this little piece here from Luther is really thematic uh, for our conference. And, and we're going to be talking a little more about this when we look at uh, Oswald Bayer's paper a little later on today. But here's what Luther says. These are the three persons and one God who has given himself to us all wholly and completely with all that he is and has. The Father gives himself to us with heaven and earth and all creatures in order that they may serve us and benefit us. But this gift has become obscured useless through Adam's fall. Therefore the Son himself has subsequently, has subsequently gave himself and bestowed all his works, sufferings, wisdom, and righteousness, and reconciled us to the Father in order that we might be restored to life and righteousness, that we might also know and have the Father and his gifts. Next slide. The little statement from Confession of Christ's Supper anticipates then Luther's confession also of the Holy Spirit. We see an example of Luther's confession of the Holy Spirit, how to use Luther's own words, Christ made the Holy Spirit a preacher. In Luther's sermon on John 16, where Luther writes, here Christ makes the Holy Spirit a preacher. He does so to prevent one from gaping toward heaven in, su such in search of him as the fluttering spirits and enthusiasts do and from divorcing him from the word of the ministry. One should know and learn that he will be in and with the word, and that it will guide us into all truth, in order that we may believe it, use it as a weapon, be preserved by it, uh, by it against all the lies and deceptions of the devil, and prevail in all trials and temptations. The Holy Spirit wants this truth which he is to impress into our hearts to be so firmly fixed that reason and all one's thoughts and feelings are relegated to the background. He wants us to adhere solely to the word and to regard it as the only truth. And in and through this word alone, he governs the Christian church 
to the end. Uh, in the large catechism, Luther speaks of how Christ's work has been accomplished once and for all in his atoning death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead. But he says, unless this gift were delivered to us, it would all be for naught. Um, that redemption is both done and delivered. It is not enough that Christ died, or even that Christ rose from the dead, unless this is good news that is preached to us. Hence, for Luther, the gospel always requires the for you. It is not just a report of something that happened back there in history, even though history is absolutely essential, and it did happen under Pontius Pilate, and he was raised from the dead on the third day. But it is only as this good news is preached to us, and it is made our own. And this is the office and the work of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, whom Luther says has made, uh, Christ has made of him a preacher to proclaim this in the word of God, in the oral word of the ministry. And so the Spirit is dispatched from the Father and the Son. And in the words of the Nicene Creed, of course, is with the Father and Son worshipped and glorified. But it's the Spirit who delivers now the gospel, the good news, uh, the good news to us. A few years ago, during the height of the so-called charismatic movement in North America, two Canadian theologians, uh, Frederick Bruner and William Horton, uh, wrote a little book entitled, Holy Spirit, Shy Member of the Trinity. And of course, in one way, the Holy Spirit is not timid, he's not shy, he's very bold in the proclamation of the truth of Christ. But the author's point, nevertheless, is well taken, that the Holy Spirit does not call attention to himself. <clears throat> that the Holy Spirit is the one who brings Jesus Christ into focus, full and clear. And in Jesus Christ, as Luther says, we see the fatherly heart of God revealed, given access uh, to uh, the Father. What I would like to do now uh, in this next section is suggest that we learn how to confess Luther's explanation of the creed in reverse. Uh, that is, we think about starting uh, with the third article of the creed and work backwards. Uh, of course, we know the shape of the creed begins with the confession, I believe in God the Father Almighty and his Son Jesus Christ, and then the confession of the Holy Spirit. But the order is also reversible. Think of it like this. Uh, when we begin with the third article, it actually leads us to the second article. Recall the words of the small catechism. I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ this is most certainly true. The focus of the third article of the creed is actually on the gospel. And the gospel is the good news about Jesus Christ. Uh, the good news that Jesus Christ is my Lord. The Holy Spirit calling us back to the second article, as it were, uh, to the confession of Christ. 
And there again, second article, you know the words, I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own, live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he is risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity. This is most certainly true. Third article takes us to the second article. And the second article then takes us to the first article. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from all eternity. And it is the Spirit now who preaches. Next slide. It is the Spirit who preaches the Son, who gives us access to the Father. Uh, think of the great Pentecost hymn from the Reformation. Come, holy light, guide divine. Now cause the word of life to shine. Teach us to know our God aright and call him Father with delight. From every error keep us free. Let none but Christ our master be. That we in saving faith abide in him our Lord. With all our might confide. Alleluia, alleluia. Spirit causes the word of life to shine that we might know our God aright and call him Father with delight. We see that uh, the Spirit, next slide, uh, we see that the Spirit carries all the verbs of sanctification in the third article. Uh, sanctification is finally not our project, but rather the Holy Spirit's work as he brings us into Christ's holy kingdom. Luther describes it like this from the large catechism. Just as the Son obtains dominion by purchasing us through his birth, death, and resurrection, etc., so the Holy Spirit affects our being made holy through the following. The community of saints, or Christian church, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. That is, he first leads us into this holy community, placing us in the church's lap, where he preaches to us and brings us to Christ. Think again of how Luther locates the work of the Holy Spirit in, in the third article. In this Christian church, he daily and richly forgives me my sins and the sins of all believers. This holy church, made holy by the holy thing, Luther says, the word of God. That word of God is the agency by which God declares us to be holy. Uh, our holiness is found only in Christ Jesus, the one who forgives our sins and gives us in that forgiveness life and salvation. And so in the second article, Christ has redeemed us and as his own position, possession, we live under him in his kingdom and serve him. Christ Jesus came not to be served but to serve not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Think there of Mark 10 verse 45. Only as we are claimed by him and given life in his kingdom can we then serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence and blessedness. We serve him only insofar as he has served us 
made us his own, bestowed on us his righteousness, given us a place in his kingdom. And so the second article then takes us back to the first, where it is our duty to thank, praise, serve, and obey the Father. Remember the words of the small catechism. Next slide. I believe that God has made me and all creatures, and that he has given me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my reason and all my senses, and still takes care of them. He also gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, animals, and all that I have. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life. He defends me against all danger and guards and protects me from all evil. All this he does only out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy, without any merit or worthiness in me. For all this it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. Third article takes us to the second article, that I may be his own, live under him in his kingdom, serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. And second article takes us back to the first article, where it is our duty, in light of God's fatherly divine goodness and mercy, now to thank, praise, serve, and obey him. That is, our vocation is located in creation. Uh, I've tried to uh, demonstrate this, by the way, uh, with the handout, the three circles, uh, each of the articles of the Apostles' Creed uh, from the Catechism. Uh, starting with uh, the third article, uh, where in contrast to his confession of the first and second article, where Luther begins with the statement, I believe, statement of faith, in his confession of the third article, he begins with a confession of inability to believe. I believe that I cannot believe. I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord uh, or come to him. Uh, you'll also notice in the third article, which we call the article of sanctification, there is nearly a word about our doing anything. Uh, it, God is carrying all the action of the verbs. Huh? It is the Holy Spirit who calls by the gospel. It is the Holy Spirit who enlightens, sanctifies, keeps me with Jesus Christ in this one true faith. It is the Holy Spirit who daily and richly forgives me my sins and the sins of all believers in this church. And it is the Holy Spirit who on the last day will raise me and all the dead and give unto me and all believers in Christ eternal life. There are no verbs of human action in the third article. Every verb is carried by the Spirit. But when we move back to the second article, huh? there the verbs of redemption are carried by Christ alone. He, but then Luther confesses he has made me his own that I might live under him in his kingdom and serve him. Now there is something that we are to do. But we are to serve him precisely because he has already rescued us. We do not serve him in order that we might be the children of God. We serve him because he has already claimed us, made us his own possession. And the second article leads then back to the first, uh, where Luther confesses the doctrine of justification already, in the first article, speaking of how God has, even in creation, demonstrated that he is the Lord who saves us, not or who establishes us, 
not on the basis of anything we do, but purely out of his fatherly divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in me. And it is only from that aspect that we are then duty-bound to thank, praise, serve, and obey him. And this thanksgiving, praise, service, and obedience takes place actually in our vocation, and it's in creation. Called by the Spirit to faith in the gospel of Christ Jesus, we have access to God the Father, the Almighty Maker of heaven and earth. And this access to heaven now frees us for a life of service and obedience on earth. Luther very famously said, keep your good works out of heaven. They don't belong there, but they do belong on earth. God doesn't need your good works, but your neighbor does. And these good works, fruits of faith, are lived out in one's earthly vocation. God's generosity is the source then of our giving. Uh, the creed begins with what God gives. His self-giving, as we have said in our program is Trinitarian self-giving. And it is God's generosity that then enlivens our own giving. Oswald Bayer has pointed out that this is beautifully expressed in the last will and testament of the Lutheran preacher and hymn writer Paul Gerhardt. I don't know how much you know about Paul Gerhardt's uh, life. Uh, after his death, he was described as a theologian who was sifted in uh, the sieve of Satan. Uh, he was driven out of his pulpit in Berlin because he staunchly uh, confessed the Lutheran doctrine of the Lord's Supper over against crypto Calvinists. Uh, he endured the horrors of the Thirty Years' War, uh, losing four of his five children to death before they uh, reached adulthood. His wife died uh, prematurely. Uh, he uh, was finally kind of forced into a very small and, uh, humanly speaking, uh, insignificant uh, uh, a parish where he uh, spent out his, uh, his years. And before he died, he prepared his will. It was addressed to his one surviving son. And he prefaces the will with these words. And here I quote Bayer, do good to people, even if they cannot repay you back because. And the reader expects that the sentence will continue with something like, God will repay you. But Paul Gerhardt frustrates that expectation by continuing. For what human beings cannot repay, the creator of heaven and earth has repaid you long ago. When he created you, when he gave you his only son, and when he accepted and received you in holy baptism as his child and heir. Notice what Gerhardt does. The life of the Christian, specifically the life of his son, is to be determined by what God has already given. We do not do good that we might later on receive good. It's not kind of a Christian karma you see here. Uh, what goes around comes around. But we do good because God has already, in his fatherly divine goodness and mercy, done good to us. When he created you, body and soul, 
when he gave his son to die for your salvation, when he made you his own in holy baptism, our vocation is an extension, in other words, of God's prior generosity to us. <coughs> and so God sanctifies us for service in the world. Uh, again, the words of Oswald Bayer, very helpful here, his little book, Living by Faith, a fine uh, kind of introduction to the distinction between justification and uh, sanctification. Uh, Bayer puts it like this, the marks of the church are the means of sanctification through which the Holy Spirit sanctifies his people according to the first table. Clearly, those who are sanctified by the work of Christ, the forgiveness of sins, are now placed in his discipleship. Nevertheless, the focus is not upon the saints, but upon sanctification. Upon the word of God in all of its sacramental forms, and also upon the secular institutions that correspond to the second table of the law. When we are sanctified, the meaning is that God himself sanctifies us by imparting himself to us as the Holy One who alone is holy. Only God is holy and what he says and speaks and does is holy. That is how God's holiness works. He does not keep it to himself, but communicates it by sharing it. Uh, Lutheran theology refers to this as the imputation of Christ's righteousness. That God does not keep his righteousness to himself, but in Christ, and for the sake of Christ, declares you to be righteous and holy. And in that sense, we indeed may, uh, uh, may agree with uh, uh, Gerhard Ferdi that sanctification is simply getting used to your justification. God declares you to be righteous. He justifies. Now you get used to it. You live righteously. And Byer says this aspect of sanctification takes place in what he calls the secular. And I know that the word secular, at least in English, uh, always raises some flags, ungodly, uh, anti-godly, anti-Christian, but secular in this sense simply means in those institutions that are of the world. Second table of the law, as we heard from Dr. Nestigan last night. Uh, parents to children. The life and the body of the neighbor in the fifth commandment. The marriage of the neighbor, sixth commandment. The property of the neighbor, seventh commandment. The reputation of the neighbor, eighth commandment. And then the things of the neighbor, uh, ninth and tenth commandment. Uh, we're going to come back to that. But you see, what Bayer is saying here is that from the Coram Deo perspective, it is God who sanctifies, who makes us holy. And now, Coram Hundibus, uh, in the face of other human beings, or Coram Mundo, in the face of the world, we lead righteous lives. Uh, we are getting used to our justification, in other words, in these institutions of the second table of the law. We are sanctified for service in the world. Where is this done? Luther identifies the three estates or hierarchies as the ecclesiastical, the domestic, uh, and next slide, and the political. Uh, in the small catechism, these three orders or three estates will form the basis of the table of duties where Luther provides biblical text for what he calls the holy orders of congregation, government, and household. Interesting there that uh, uh, Luther kind of, in, we would say, tongue-in-cheek or with humor, 
uses language that in Roman Catholicism had been associated with priesthood, with monastic order, holy orders, and he transfers that. Uh, holy orders now include the congregation where one is either a preacher or a hearer of the word of God, the civic community, government where one is citizen or governor, and the household, mother, husband, wife, mother, father, children, servants of various kinds. Uh, these are, Luther says, uh, the true holy orders, sanctified by the word of God and established by God's own institution uh, in creation. Um, just a, a side note there, there's a, a Karl Marx, not always the best Lutheran theologian, uh, but even as they say a blind squirrel finds an acorn once in a while, uh, Karl Marx once commented that Luther um, made of the monks laymen, and of the laymen he made monks. Some truth to that, uh, that Luther does not see the monastic order as a holy order, uh, where one now lives by the, you know, the monastic uh, virtues of chastity and poverty and obedience, but he actually transfers those virtues into the life of the ordinary Christian who is living out uh, the life of discipleship uh, in these holy orders, uh, separated uh, from uh, the world uh, through faith in Christ and not yet, but yet not evacuated from the world, or to use Jesus' own language, uh, being in the world but not of the world. This is uh, the life that we have uh, in, uh, in, in vocation. Uh, so the three estates, Luther uh, uses this language again in the great confession concerning Christ's Supper. I've already alluded to that, uh, 15, um, next slide, 1528, where Luther writes, the holy orders and true religious institutions are these three, the office of priest, the estate of marriage, and civil government. Uh, in uh, 1530, two years later, in his lectures on uh, his lecture on Psalm 111, Luther said that these three sta these three divine stations continue and remain throughout all kingdoms as wide as the world and to the end of the world. And then also in 1539, in his uh, on the councils and the church, uh, he writes. Uh, that the three hierarchies are ordained by God, and then he goes on to say that we need no more, indeed we have enough to do, living aright and resisting the devil in these three. Here the reformer used these three God-ordained estates as a polemic against the self-chosen works of religious orders. Next slide. Um, the three estates, they are concrete locations in life where faith is active in love, serving the well-being of the neighbor according to God's commandments. And these three estates, Luther says, are found throughout creation. No matter where you go, they appear because God instituted them already in creation. Next time. Faith is not bound to any particular order or state found, um, or to, faith is not bound to any particular order and, or a state, and it is found in all three estates, but none of them are paths to righteousness before God. Instead, they are the concrete locations where faith is active in love for the well-being of the neighbor. Uh, Luther writes, Above these three estates, or above these three institutions and orders, is the common order of Christian love, in which one serves not only the three orders, 
but also serves every needy person in general with all kinds of benevolent deeds, such as feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, forgiving enemies, praying for all men on earth, suffering all kinds of evil on earth, etc. Behold, all of these are called good and holy works. However, none of these orders is a means of salvation. There remains only one way above them all, faith in Jesus Christ. These three estates for Luther are holy orders, for they were sanctified by God's word. And every human being, according to Luther, lives in all three estates, because every one is bound by the obligations to God and the neighbor. It is the Christian who by faith recognizes that these three estates are created by God and are works of his providential care for the good of his creation. In Luther's view, God is hidden behind the mask of those who fill the various stations in the estates, using them as his instruments for his ongoing work on behalf of human beings. Luther refers here to the mask of God, to the larvae dea. God hides himself behind masks, larvae, of those who fill various stations in the estates, using them as his instruments for his ongoing work on behalf of human beings. Uh, we look at each of the three estates. Uh, next slide. Uh, the estate of the church. The first estate established in creation is the church, the place of God's speaking and human beings and human beings answering. Just as the first commandment is fundamental and universal, so human beings are created to worship their creator, and they cannot escape this demand even when the response is unbelief. In his Genesis lectures, Luther spoke of the establishment of a church without walls, preceding both the household and the state. After the fall, the church as an order of creation remains, but it is corrupted by unbelief, which is false worship. Rather than clinging to the promise of grace and blessing, human beings exchange the truth of God for the lie, and they worship the creature instead of the creator. Uh, recall there Romans 1, uh, 25. <coughs> Next slide. There's the estate of the household. Household, the second estate, is inclusive not only of the nuclear family, but of all those who live and work under the same roof. Marriage is at the center of this estate, for it is through this union that God creates and nurtures new human life. This is the place where daily bread is given and received. Living as he did before the Industrial Revolution, where daily work is generally separated from the home, Luther saw work in the context of the family and for the good of those people who are the nearest neighbors. And then there is the estate of civil government. If the second estate produces life, the third estate protects, guards, and defends life. The third estate, the political order, was founded on the household for the reformer. As he writes in the large catechism, all other authority flows and spreads out from the authority of the parents. After the fall, there is a necessity to this estate in Luther's thinking, for it functions as a coercive means to prevent human society from collapsing into complete chaos and corruption. He writes, in Genesis commentary again, there was no government of the state before sin, and there was no need of it. Civil government is a remedy required by our corrupted nature. It is necessary to be held in check by our corrupted nature. It is necessary that lust be held in check by the bonds of the law and by penalties. 
Uh, government, according to Luther, was established in creation out of the household, but the state was established after uh, the fall. So Luther does make a, a distinction between government in a kind of broad sense, which is already there with dominion being given to Adam, and state, which comes after the fall, as there is uh, the mandate uh, to uh, punish evildoers. Uh, the uh, requirement that uh, uh, one who uh, sheds blood, that his blood be shed. That was not necessary before the fall, but after the fall, Luther says, that now becomes, uh, becomes necessary. Uh, from the th uh, we, we see Luther then drawing this earlier material on the three estates and locating it in the catechism under the heading of table of duties. The three estates were articulated in the small catechism as the table of duties, de Hostafo, where Luther provides a catalog of biblical text for all kinds of holy orders. Modeled after Jean Gerizan's tractate concerning the way of life for all the faithful. Here Luther makes use of the term holy orders, which was traditionally used as a reference to monastic orders, now applying it to the various callings or walks of life within the three estates. The reformer intended that these scriptural verses would serve to admonish Christians to faithfulness in their particular offices in the church, civil community, and the household. In language reminiscent of the confession concerning Christ's Supper, written in the previous year, Luther concludes this section of the small catechism with text from Romans 13, 9, which calls for one to love the neighbor as the self, and 1 Timothy 2, 1, which urges prayers be made uh, for all uh, for all people. Uh, we would also here note uh, Luther's exposition of Psalm 127 for Christians at, uh, at Riga in, uh, in what is now Latvia, uh, Lithuania, uh, 1524, uh, where he says, God wills that man should work, and without work he will give him nothing. Uh, conversely, God will not give him anything because of his labor, but solely out of his own goodness and blessing. And then Luther goes on to say that our labor is actually nothing other than finding and collecting the gifts and the treasures that God has hidden for us in the world. Uh, he reminds the Christians uh, to go about their work but let God do, do the worry, that work and worry are often bound up together, and that uh, in the freedom of the Christian, now one can leave the worrying uh, to God. He writes, indeed, one could very well say that the core of the world, and especially the doing of his saints, are God's mask, under which he conceals himself and so marvelously, marvelously exercises dominion and introduces disorder in the world. God working, punishing sin, putting down those of high degree, that's the disorder, uh, but also in his, uh, for his own uh, good and gracious purposes, uh, ordering the world in such a way uh, that life can indeed uh, flourish. Um, now let's come back here, and I, uh, we started a little late, uh, so I might go just a few minutes uh, uh, longer here. Uh, but uh, back to this theme of the preached God, and how does all this talk about vocation uh, connect up with uh, the preached God? First of all, I would say there is no vocation without the preached God. Without the preached God, good works become an idolatry which the old creature inevitably uses as a ladder to access God in hiding. In other words, I don't know what might please God, so the old Adam wants to, to use Luther's language, play blind man's bluff with God. Uh, my reason then would dictate this is what pleases God and this therefore is the ladder that I'm going to build. Uh, whether that be uh, through an expression of religious piety, 
uh, through human morality uh, or uh, through a kind of a rationalism that uh, would say, well, this must be pleasing uh, uh, to God. Uh, Luther destroys this kind of latter theology. Vocation cannot be used as a pathway to access God. Without the preached God, we will seek God in his hidden majesty rather than in the lowliness of the manger and the cross, and then we will attempt to serve him with our own self-designated high and holy projects. Without God, without God preached, the old Adam resorts to enthusiasm. Uh, enthusiasm, literally God within. Um, and that creates a market for all things in the field of spirituality. Uh, Luther complained about the enthusiast of his day uh, as those who had swallowed the Holy Ghost feathers and all. And uh, looking then for the, you know, uh, for the spirit within. Uh, small called articles, he condemns enthusiasm. Uh, you know those words, no doubt. This is all of the old devil and the old snake who also turned Adam and Eve into enthusiasts and led them from the external word of God to spirituality and their own presumption. Although he even accomplished this by means, uh, even though, although he even accomplished this by means of other external words. You think again of Genesis 3. Did God really say? There's an external word of the serpent set in conflict and in contrast to the external word that God had already given Adam and Eve. And I love this quote then from Oswald Bayer. Those who want to search for the Holy Spirit deep within, deep inside themselves in the realm too deep for words uh, to express will find ghosts, not God. Great imagery. What does a ghost do? It haunts. Uh, but not the Holy Ghost, not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who comes uh, in and through the external word, uh, comforts, consoles, uh, gives us all the gifts of Christ Jesus. But when we look inside, we find not the Holy Spirit, but only ghost, Meyer says. And then enthusiasm becomes a substitute for vocation. Uh, we don't have uh, uh, time to cover all of this, but Luther has a strong, ongoing, unrelenting polemic against self-chosen works. Uh, works that I would designate as holy. Works that I would choose to perform because I think that by these works I am serving uh, God. And in this case, then, it is our word, not God's word, that declares a work to be uh, holy. Uh, and that is, for Luther, a clear form of enthusiasm. He sees monasticism uh, as an expression of enthusiasm. Because God has not instituted withdrawal from the world, forsaking of marriage, uh, forsaking of life in the world as the way of discipleship, uh, but he has instituted marriage. He has uh, commanded that we honor Caesar and that we pay taxes and that we work for the benefit of the neighbor. Monasticism uh, under or, or overthrows that. Uh, and, and so he sees monasticism as an example of enthusiasm, of vocation where God is unpreached, and which is a contradiction then, as I said, in, in terms. Um, how do I know what pleases God? Um, for Luther, it's really pretty simple. Uh, God's commandments and one station in life. You have the Ten Commandments, you don't need more commandments. You've got these commandments of God, uh, and God has put you in a particular place in life. And so where the commandments of God intersect with your station in life, there you are, in fact, uh, given the knowledge of what you ought to do uh, to serve the neighbor in love. Uh, we see Luther providing an example of this 
as he reflects back on his own life uh, in a letter that he writes to his father. Uh, his father, remember, was quite disappointed when Luther decided to go into the monastery. Um, and there were all kinds of good reasons for his father to be disappointed because uh, there was no social security system. And Luther had, Luther's father thought that by sending his son to law school, uh, he would be securing his own uh, kind of financial uh, well-being in his later years. Uh, the, uh, Luther's father was also looking forward to grandchildren, and uh, monasticism would both uh, cut off the possibility of grandchildren as well as financial support. And uh, Luther was pretty stubborn in his insistence uh, that monasticism was God's calling for his life. But Luther came to repent of that. And in a letter that Luther wrote to his father not long before his father's death, he says, For my vow was not worth a fit, since by taking it I withdrew myself from the authority of my father and the intent of God's commandment. Luther recognized that his monastic vow was not based on God's word. He says, in short, it was taken in accordance with the doctrines of men and the superstition of hypocrites, which God has not uh, commanded. Hallmark of Lutheran doctrine of vocation in light of the preached God would be Luther's little Reformation track of 1520 uh, on the freedom of the Christian, and particularly uh, this paragraph. In conclusion, Luther writes, as, as Christians, we do not live in ourselves, but in Christ and the neighbor. Otherwise, we are not a Christian. As Christians, we live in Christ through faith and in the neighbor through love. Through faith, we are caught up beyond ourselves into God. Likewise, through love, we descend beneath ourselves through love uh, to, serve, uh, to serve our our, our neighbor. Uh, so that uh, for Luther, vocation is re really being drawn outside of yourself. And this can happen only where God is preached. Where God is preached, there is the promise, and where there's the promise, there is faith. So we are drawn out of ourselves into Christ, living in him by faith, and at the same time where there is faith, there will be love for the neighbor. And so Luther says, drawn outside of ourselves, we are drawn into the neighbor's life to live, uh, to, to live a life of self-giving toward the neighbor, love, uh, uh, love toward uh, the neighbor. Uh, then uh, conclusion, I'll try to uh, summarize this as we're running out of time. Uh, we might put it like this. The Augsburg Confession talks about new obedience. What makes new obedience new? the gospel. God preached. It is only in the light of God preached that the new obedience is a reality. The new obedience that does God's will to use, to paraphrase the language of Formula of Concord, Article 6, out of a free and merry spirit. Not under the compulsion of a slave, but in the freedom of a son, a daughter, of God. When, when and where God is preached, we are freed from self-defined paths to perfection. When and where God is preached, perfection is found not in our good works, but in true fear of God and true faith in God, which is demonstrated in Christian love and true good works according to each person's calling. That's the language of the Augsburg Confession, Article 16. Uh, where God is preached, only then will there be true fear of God and true faith in God and genuine good works uh, which are directed not toward the project of my salvation, that's accomplished in Christ and mine through faith, but toward the needs uh, of the neighbor. Uh, it is only where God is preached that the new obedience really does exist. And then in that new obedience, 
We can confess with Luther at the end of the first article, for all this, it is my duty to thank, praise, serve, and obey him. For all of this, for God's fatherly divine goodness and mercy made manifest in our creation, accomplished in the work of Jesus Christ who died and rose again for our salvation, and now delivered without any merit or strength on my part by the Holy Spirit who has called me, who has called me uh, by the gospel. Thank you very much. Hjertelig takk til deg, John, for en grundig og oppbyggelig og lærerig gjennomgang. Da synger vi på nummer 633. Og etter det så strekker vi litt på føden, og så er det, så er det Jan Byggstad klokka 11.